Well, good afternoon. First of all, let me say it is a real honor to be uh, here addressing the Rotary uh, International Club today. Um, we got, during the course, uh, you notice the title, Leadership Lessons from a Lifetime of Extreme Learning. Basically, we're going to be exploring innovation, uh, innovation as a process, and then how innovation actually occurs. So uh, the last time I was at a Rotary meeting, I noticed there was a very, very strong veteran presence. So I thought I might uh, present, instead of my, my normal examples, I might present a lot of examples from uh, military history along the way, especially as we have uh, Independence Day uh, coming along pretty soon. So, uh, as was in the introduction, yes, I, I'm a West Point graduate, although I should mention I uh, received a presidential appointment to West Point from Richard Nixon, so there's a rumor that the whole Watergate scandal was just a cover-up for him sending me to West Point. But uh, yes, commanded a couple of different Special Forces operational attachments. Uh, I was an R&D engineer on the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, it's commonly known as Star Wars at the time under Ronald Reagan. Uh, strategy consultant for a long time with Pricewaterhouse, Deloitte, A.T. Kearney, managed a $6 billion pension fund for the Department of Defense at one point, and I've studied judo since I was about 10 years old. So, but mo most importantly, down there at the bottom is I read a lot of books, as you, as you might suspect any professor would. So this presentation really draws upon some of my life experiences, but also draws upon those things that I have learned by what we call standing on the shoulders of giants. That means basically learning from others. So this is going to be a recurring theme as we kind of go through the presentation today, meaning that we should really be learning from all those people who uh, have gone before us. So I'm going to start off with uh, the martial arts, uh, which is, you know, I started off, like I said, at a very young age. <clears throat> and what we, they teach us is, is most everything evolves from necessity, technology, and drive, drive by the individual. So if we define technology as the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, uh, that gets us close to what technology actually is. Many people just think it's uh, you know, computers and things. Merriam-Webster actually uh, defines it as uh, technology as the practical application of knowledge in a particular area. So martial arts consists of uh, usually three basic uh, types of techniques, throwing techniques, grappling techniques, and striking techniques. And each category applies uh, scientific knowledge to become much more effective. Uh, you know, uh, karate, taekwondo, they, they emphasize striking techniques and the mechanics of the body to most effectively do that. Uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you've probably heard of, uh, emphasizes grappling techniques. And of course, uh, Chinese Kung Fu started off uh, you know, in, in China fighting, studying different animals to be able to find effective fighting techniques and looking that way. But uh, the martial arts I'm going to talk about here is uh, judo. <clears throat> and in, the, in, in ancient Japan, the, uh, the, the, the samurai studied an art called jujitsu. And jujitsu is basically, you know, if, uh, the art of fighting with, not with a sword, that would be another art, but, uh, you know, with your bare hands to be able to uh, render your opponent, uh, you know, uh, defeat him in combat. So jujitsu, you know, they practiced all the different uh, ways, the striking techniques, the grappling techniques, the throwing techniques. <clears throat> and then, uh, but it, over time, uh, they had a shift in Japan as the, as the culture started to open up and they had something called the Meiji Restoration come in that took over uh, the shogunate governments, the military governments. And during that time, jujitsu uh, started to become less and less practiced. But along came the guy you see in the upper left-hand corner, his name is Jigoro Kano. And he was a little skinny kid in, uh, growing up. Um, he was really smart. So when he went off to boarding school, he was small and smart. So he got picked on a lot. So he decided to go off and learn jujitsu. And he mastered a, a couple of different styles of jujitsu. But as jujitsu became less and less practiced because of the new change in governments, which occurred around this time, he felt that there was a lot of really good things in jujitsu. And so what he did was he founded judo as a sport. So he took out the lethal techniques and he made it into a sport. Now, judo today is an Olympic sport, um, and it's also a philosophy, and it's also pretty much a way of life. In fact, jiu-jitsu, you notice that he just changed the last word to judo. Do is basically a way of life. So he, he adopted uh, judo in this way, and at one point when the uh, Tokyo Police Department was looking for the art that they should be teaching their policemen, they had a big tournament uh, judo won uh, almost all the matches, 
and uh, became pretty dominant. Um, and Jigoro Kano, he was very grateful. He learned English when he was uh, growing up in Japan at boarding school. And he was very grateful all the things that he'd learned from other parts of the world, other, you know, other people teaching him. So he decided to send his students all around the world to be able to, to uh, spread judo. So he had a vision. He embraced the foreign ideas and the languages. He actually formed the Japanese Olympic Committee so he could get judo exposed to the world and a way to give back. And uh, several things happened. Brazilian jiu-jitsu actually comes from one of uh, uh, Jiro Kano's students, Conde Coma, going to Brazil and linking up with a gentleman named Helio Gracie. Uh, of course, <clears throat> you know, it, these things evolve by necessity. So the Gracies uh, took the judo techniques <clears throat> and they found that in uh, Brazil, most of the time, uh, a fight would end up on the ground, rolling around. And so they adopted mostly the grappling techniques from judo. Europe, they did a, uh, a lot more of the stand-up stuff. In fact, if you go to Europe, you'll find uh, a, uh, Europe, it's on TV a lot in, uh, you know, and it's one of the world's most practiced martial arts to this day. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> excuse me, while the USA has like a 30,000 members in, in, the, in the Judo Association, France, which is about the size of Texas, has 500,000. Germany, 600,000. So I was in the Argentina uh, refereeing uh, last year, and I noticed that every country club had a judo, ten a tennis, and a soccer center. So, and yes, if you look down at the lower left-hand side, that is, in fact, Vladimir Putin wearing a judo uniform. He practiced as a young and uh, became a, a regional champion. So once again, we're looking at the evolution of uh, necessity here and being able to drive and, and bring it through. So here's uh, the, uh, the professor. Here I am at SMU. And professors, we, we try to provide frameworks for thinking. <clears throat> and once again, most everything evolves out of necessity, technology, and drive. So <clears throat> identifying the necessity, applying the technology, and having the drive to follow through, this often leads to success. And that's some of the things we're going to talk about as we move forward here. <clears throat> Probably recognize this guy, Dr. Emmett Brown from Back to the Future. His uh, famous DeLorean time machine it was enabled by the flux capacitor, but he was an inventor. Uh, inventors are not necessarily innovators, and they're most likely not entrepreneurs. Uh, inventors, they basically invent stuff. Uh, innovators usually come up with new ideas and not necessarily inventions. Uh, we'll explore some of this later on, but uh, inventors usually take ideas that are out there and combine them in new and unique different ways to be able to come up with a new way of uh, doing, you know, of meeting a need. And then entrepreneurs actually commercialize these new products and these new services. And they actually are the ones who go out and make, try and make money off of uh, new ideas. So I'm going to bring you back to uh, Carl Van Clausewitz. Um, he was a Prussian general. He was one of the great military theorists of our time. Uh, he served in the campaigns against Napoleon, um, but he studied Frederick the Great, he studied Napoleon, and he wrote a book called On War. Uh, I had to read On War as an undergrad at West Point, and uh, let, I would not recommend you reading it. It's a, it's a real slog. It's written in kind of old German, but it has brilliant ideas in it, and I'm going to share some of those with you. Uh, one is he really stressed kind of the dialectical interaction of a bunch of diverse factors. Uh, he came up with the term that basically describe the unexpected developments uh, un unfolding under what he calls the fog of war, which means just the total confusion. So, uh, you know, military planning is really great until the first shot is fired, as often said. Uh, Mike Tyson often says a, 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 flight, a fight plan really goes well until you get hit in the mouth. So these, this is when the unexpected happens, and this is what you have to be prepared for. And so his, his theory on the coup d'oeil, which is how you pronounce that, means a, in French it means at a glance but there, he, he discusses different types of intuition you've got uh, regular intuition if you watch NCIS you know Leroy Jethro Gibbs has his uh, his gut he's relying on his gut his intuition uh, you have expert intuition kind of the next level up that's when like an EMT uh, you know sees somebody in distress he's able to quickly call upon his past experiences and uh, start to be able to do the medical procedures to bring that person forward. Um, then you've got Clausewitz's uh, strategic intuition, and that's what we've just decided here. And it, it's being able to deal with the uh, unknown situations. 
And he's stressing that you constantly have to learn and increase what, you know, your database basically in your brain uh, to be able to do that. So uh, strategic intuition draws upon the experience of everybody else in the world. So, but you have all this information in your brain, but at some point you have to have a presence of mind. So you have to clear, clear your mind of all your expectations and get rid of all your preconceived notions to be able to come up with an idea that would be able to apply to the situation at the time. And then once you do that, once you kind of clear your mind, you can actually have a flash of insight. Um, so, you know, having the presence of mind. So when do you really get your good ideas? Well, people, um, I had some students who did some surveys and they came up with uh, people, you know, taking a shower or falling asleep or in traffic or uh, many people actually use meditation to be able to, to clear their minds. But in the end, once you come up with a flash of insight by coming together with these new combinations of things that you've learned from other places, um, you must have the will to follow through and create a difference. And one of the examples that uh, we find uh, and that Kudoe is uh, Napoleon, how he got famous. Um, Toulon uh, was uh, an important French port uh, and the, the generals and the staff and Napoleon just showed up as a brand new captain. Uh, mostly he'd ha he hadn't had any combat experience. He'd uh, you know, gone through the military schools and those sorts of things, but uh, uh, he had several things that he'd learned over time. He learned how to read a contour map, which is a map that shows you the different elevations. He was an artillery officer. He knew how to deploy uh, different kinds of light cannon. He studied the American Revolutionary War and the Siege of Boston, where uh, Henry Knox, uh, you know, drug cannon up to Dorchester Heights to command the harbor, and then uh, the British fled uh, because they were afraid that they'd be cut off from their navy as the uh, Henry Knox was taking pot shots at their navy there in Boston Harbor. And he also noticed the Siege of Orleans in 1429, where Joan of Arc saved England from the conquest by England by not going directly to the, to the stronghold, to the fortress of Orleans, but took smaller forts around the city and then uh, was able to eventually take over the main fortress itself. But so Napoleon never fought a battle like Toulon, but he had all these elements on the shelves in his mind. And um, he was able to contradict the, the original thought, which was to do a direct assault. Now, in military terms, a direct assault on a, uh, a, strong, a stronghold, a strong defense is never a good idea. Usually, um, you're going to lose a lot of people and a lot of equipment. Um, but he said, hey, look, based upon these things, uh, if you take the fort of uh, Aguet, um, the English are probably going to abandon the town. The fort of Aguet actually overlooked Toulon. Uh, once he got his cannon up there, he was able to take pot shots at the, uh, the English Navy. And so the English did, in fact, abandon the town. No one had thought of this. Napoleon came in, and once he did this, as you might suspect, he became very, very famous. And within two years, actually, this and some other very heroic deeds that he did, uh, he was a general at age 24. <clears throat> so innovation. So how do you find the constantly changing need to be met or the continually evolving technology? Well, research and reading. Um, throughout Ben Franklin's life, he constantly invested roughly an hour a day in deliberate learning. Warren Buffett, the, uh, one of the richest people in the world, spends five to six hours a day reading five newspapers and 500 pages of corporate reports. Bill Gates says he reads 50 books a year. Mark Zuckerberg reads one book every two weeks. Elon Musk grew up reading two books a day, according to his brother. And even Oprah Winfrey said, hey, look, books were my past to personal freedom. Arthur Bank, uh, co-founder of Home Depot, two, reads two hours a day. Dan Gilbert, uh, self-made billionaire, owner, owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers, reads two hours a day. But So once you have this foundation of knowledge, that enables you to innovate. So there's a constantly changing evolution of needs to be met in the world. There's a constantly evolving level of technology to apply to those needs. Finding where technology meets a need and following through well, that's the key to in innovation as we're talking about today. But at the same time, if you're an innovator, you're gonna meet some adversity. And here my example is uh, my alma mater, West Point. Um, Sylvanus Thayer, uh, the gentleman there in the, in the top middle, he is now known universally as a father of the military academy, but he had a really rough start. 
1799, George Washington wrote to Alexander Hamilton a letter recommending the establishment of a military academy. Uh, Hamilton at the time was in charge of a 10,000 man army and looking to eject some professional into it. Uh, but upon his election in 1801, Thomas Jefferson did two things. One, he didn't like Hamilton, so he disbanded Hamilton's army. But he did enforce the idea of a military academy. So in 1802, the United States Military Academy was established. Um, at the time, uh, the, the American public really wasn't uh, high on standing armies because the British had been uh, stationing themselves in their homes. And so they, they put the academy out uh, in, a, in basically the middle of nowhere, which is West Point. Uh, West Point, you probably know, is famous for having Benedict Arnold almost turn it over to the, you know, to the British. But uh, the initial uh, entrees into West Point as a cadet were all pol all political considerations. Um, as, as the War of 1812 came around, we find that uh, the, the politically appointed officers who came up from not from West Point, from other other parts from the states, they didn't do so well because they had no training. Uh, and they were just politically appointees. Uh, President Madison noticed this, got real serious about West Point because the uh, West Pointers distinguished themselves to the man during the War of 1812. And he, unfortunately, he appointed uh, uh, Superintendent pa uh, Partridge. Uh, and Partridge tended to play favorites. Uh, he allowed his nephew to chop down trees around the academy and sell them. And so eventually by 1817, uh, Madison replaces him with Sylvanus Thayer. Now Thayer had been to Europe to study all the different military schools there, gather a lot of knowledge, brought back a lot of useful books. Uh, he, sh he shows up at West Point to find that, that the cadets favored by Partridge were on extended paid leave. Faculty members who had the audacity to disagree with Partridge were all under arrest and cadets were basically acting like spoiled brats. So he immediately, because of the vision that he had created uh, by studying the military academies in Europe, he immediately changed to a more disciplined and scientific uh, approach to studies. Uh, of course, at one point, Partridge came back to West Point and attempted a coup, but the Secretary of War just had him removed. But strict military discipline, a demerit system, scientific studies, a detailed timetable of Cadets Day were all put into effect. Uh, a solid four-year curriculum of academics was adopted. Unlike some military academies overseas, they were very focused on academics, mostly because at the time, uh, uh, the, this young country needed uh, a lot of engineering skills. So the Thayer system was now born. Uh, many of the cadets who attended West Point during Thayer's tenure held key leadership positions during the Mexican War and the American Civil War. Uh, Andrew Jackson uh, came along. He is now elected president. Uh, now, Andrew Jackson came from very humble beginnings. It was a self-educated soldier. And he viewed West Point as being way too aristocratic and snobbish. So it soon became practice for any time Thayer dismissed a cadet for discipline, Jackson would just automatically overwrite Thayer and reinstate him. Um, abolishing the academy was discussed frequently, but unfortunately politicians were used to giving appointments to uh, sons of their supporters that that, that couldn't happen. But uh, you know th these disagreements with Jackson eventually weren't there, and he left West Point to go be the chief engineer for Boston. Uh, he went also to found uh, Dartmouth's Thayer School of Engineering. But the good news is that the Thayer system was in place and holding, and still holds to this day. So he had the vision from his experience as well as studying military academies all over Europe. He had the will to put those foundations into place, and despite all the political shifts, uh, all those. Uh, all those disciplines are still in place. So in this case, we're, we're, we see where a transformational leader met and overcame adversity. Next, we're gonna look at, uh, in, with our Independence Day theme, look at the Army Airborne here. <clears throat> so the Army Airborne, I'm gonna introduce to you three exceptional leaders. Some you may not associate with the Airborne. One has been Franklin, uh, Billy Mitchell, who is well best known for uh, establishing the uh, United States Air Force, and then uh, Jim Gavin. So the, the actual idea of deploying tropes behind the front lines of battle had a very, had very early roots. In a letter to the Dutch scientist uh, Ingehus on January 16th, 1784, uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote of his vision to have 10,000 men descend from balloons to cause an infinite deal of mischief behind enemy lines. This was from balloons, but it was a uh, 
you know, still coming in, there's still that thinking in uh, a different way rather than have frontal assaults. So, and, and airborne, um, you know, if we define strategy as the aim of war and tactics as the way to achieve the strategy, there's three key, key elements that we think about, typically, uh, often think about uh, the algebraic, the biological, the psychological elements. Uh, algebraic elements consider the number of men per area, time, material, scientific relationship between these three. Uh, it, it's, a, it's sometimes it's very difficult to, to as, a, as an army, control an entire area. So you have to think about how to do it. Biological elements consider the sorrow that goes with the death of one person and the religious ties. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia asked really, how much can a society take before it will stop fighting and avoid casualties? Then it had these, the psychological elements and the attitudes of the fighting force. You know, propaganda becomes a very strong influencing agent sometimes with both the minds of the of fighting and those who are actually neutral or, or back home, you know, supporting or not supporting the troops. Um, so, you know, during World War I, uh, most fighting was done in the trenches with armed forces concentrated heavily in those forward areas. Uh, military strategists maintained that a country really couldn't afford to defend an entire countryside and devoted all their army and firepower up to the front lines. And this left the rear area somewhat vulnerable. Uh, this is where Billy Mitchell comes in. He recognized this and he started thinking in uh, three rather than two dimensions. The two dimensions would be on the ground, back and forth, right and left, where he said a third dimension, uh, use air power, use airplanes to vault troops into advantageous positions, either land airplanes behind there or potentially even use uh, uh, para the new parachute. So he actually proposed an airborne assault to be conducted in October uh, 1918. Now he had trouble getting parachutes and men to volunteer. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the war ended before the mission was conducted, but the thoughts were there. And Billy Mitchell never really abandoned the airborne concept and continued to write about uh, developing this capability of parachuting troops behind enemy lines to create havoc. Uh, his, his ideas made it into a program in 1928 where he trained three volunteers to parachute from a bomber and then set up and fire a machine gun within three minutes of landing as a part of a demonstration, and it was successful. Uh, in the early days of World War II, he started to see a lot more interest in relocating infantry troops using aircraft. Uh, in 1938, German forces landed a strong force in Vienna to occupy Austria. Later in the year, uh, Field Marshal von Rundstedt used 305 Junker 52 transport planes to move 2,800 men with complete weapons into Czech, in the Czech Sudetenland. Uh, these blitzkrieg operations, uh, the strategists began to consider small, highly trained groups could be inserted behind enemy lines for specific missions such as demolitions, destroying communication centers, and other key structures such as bridges. At the same time, these groups could conduct uh, reconnaissance operations, even potentially hold key positions until they were relieved by conventional forces. So this is all part of the, the German blitzkrieg approach. So flash forward, we have a young captain at West Point uh, who found himself in the Department of Tactics, which is mostly concerned with cadet discipline. His name is Jim Gavin. He became very interested in the German, uh, German airborne operations victories in Europe and began teaching classes on those subjects whenever he had the opportunity. Uh, the United States had managed to get access to the original documents concerning German airborne operations in Holland and the military attaché in Cairo uh, was able to provide details on German parachute and glider operations in Crete. So uh, Captain Gavin leaves West Point, uh, successfully makes his way through the parachute school in Fort Benning, Georgia, and he becomes eventually the company commander of the 503rd Parachute Infantry Battalion. And not too much time later, December 7th, 1941, a day that will live on in infamy. American becomes involved in World War II. At this point, the, in January 1942, the War Department directs four parachute regiments to be formed. The 505th Parachute Infra Regiment was activated at Fort Benning in July 1942, and now Colonel Gavin is its first commanding officer. A parachute infra regiment, by the way, has about 2,000 men. Uh, they were chosen to parachute into Sicily on July 10th, 1943, which made it the first regimental sized combat jump in the history of the United States Army. All this from the vision of Benjamin Franklin and Billy Mitchell and being able to, you know, give Jim Gavin a very quick start. Uh, by the way, Jim Gavin was the only general to have four combat parachute jumps in World War II. Uh, Sicily, uh, and his next mission was to parachute a night assault conducted in support of the Normandy landings. Uh, his mission was to capture the town store at, at Saint Mary Glace. 
which is a critical communication center that would you know be able to aid in the landing at uh, Utah Beach and then further destroy bridges that will allow the German counterattack. Uh, as the commander of the 82nd Air War Division, General Gavin led his troops on Operation Market Garden, where he was to seize bridges over the uh, the Moss River and uh, the, the Wall River in Nijmegen. And later, General Gavin led the 82nd Air War Division during a final at the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, something on another little trivia on the uh, uh, Normandy invasion, the, the President Roosevelt's oldest son, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., was the only general officer to actually land on the Normandy beaches. But you probably see in the upper right hand corner there, uh, General Eisenhower speaking with members of the 101st Airborne Division just before they jumped into France to support the Normandy invasion. This is where something called commander's intent becomes essential. And this is in, in the str in strategy we always talk about being able to get, uh, get the word out as to exactly where the company is going or exactly where the military, what the military mission is. Um, Eisenhower used to say that the military plans are nothing but military plan is everything. That's because things never really go as planned, but people need to know the overall strategy so they can react. In the case of the airborne assault, just nobody really landed where they were supposed to due to the fog of war with tracer bullets and people getting lost and you know airplanes getting shot at then. But uh, what they did know is they were supposed to get behind enemy lines, create havoc, cause confusion to the Germans, and that's exactly what they did. And American airborne units have been an essential part of our strategy ever since. Let's talk about Army Rangers a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, Robert Ro Rogers, John Mosby, and William Darby. Uh, Robert Rogers distinguished himself in the French and Indian War, kind of set the foundation for Ranger elements. Uh, John Mosby, during the Civil War, is known as the Gray Ghost. And then William Darby, uh, World War II in the First Ranger Battalion. So, you know, the first explorers and settlers in the New World brought with them the, the ways of Europe. More specifically, most of them were schooled in the European method of engaging in warfare. In Europe, uh, conventional rather than irregular warfare became the standard uh, as it's kind of pl played in set pieces. Large-scale religious wars had evolved into large armies led by professional officers hailing from aristocracy that were leading a collection of mostly mercenaries combined with uh, those in what we might call the lower classes of society. It was difficult and expensive to replace a trained army, and battles of maneuver on a large field became the norm. Both sides would maneuver around to gain a decided advantage rather than engaging uh, in an actual battle that resulted in large-scale casualties and attrition. So that it was contained, it was controlled, and this is just the way warfare was done, mostly in good weather, so general, generals could see and be able to appropriately control troop movements. Uh, tactics such as raids and ambushes were frowned upon because they were pretty much ungentlemanly at the time. Uh, in the New World, things are dramatically different. The, in, the Indian that was here was a hunter, and uh, you know, war was just a natural part of their existence as they fought for turf. Uh, but it was not the gentlemanly war that they fought by the aristocratic uh, kings of Europe. Indians avoided planned battles and fought in, fought in the open and favored surprise raids and surprise ambushes. Uh, given the large distances between tribes and settlements, a small band would travel many miles through rough terrain to conduct a surprise attack on their enemy. They would hide behind trees rather than standing out in the open. They would only pump up to shoot their arrows when they had the advantages on a tactical level. <clears throat> and they blended into their environment and made the best use of the weapons they had with the goal of inflicting the greatest harm while minimizing casualties. The, and the ultimate test of the warrior in this case was bravery in battle. Uh, the term ranger had actually been associated with those who ranged far into the dense and unexplored forests of England as early as the 13th century. Uh, the 17th century found the title being more frequently used in association with irregular military organizations, such as border rangers who guarded the harsh frontier borders uh, between England and, and Scotland. Um, 1756, uh, Major Robert Rog Rogers of New Hampshire uh, was recruited and organized nine companies of American colonists, and his purpose was to train them in ranger tactics to support the British in the French and Indian War. <clears throat> These uh, ranger tactics, as you might suspect, were derived from uh, those being used by frontiersmen, which they learned from the Indians. Um, and it was, what was different was uh, Major Rogers incorporated them into a doctrine of standing organized fighting forces, and they were officially dubbed the Ranger Company of the New Hampshire Provincial Regiment. 
<clears throat> this unit was known for being well trained, conducting very daring operations that included deep penetration behind enemy lines. Uh, they, and they were disbanded after the war, but they really left an indelible mark on history and the traditions of the American military. And it was considered to be the first true Ranger unit as their organization tactics were absorbed and built upon by subsequent Ranger type units. <clears throat> but these kinds of tactics were the ones that enabled, uh, at least initially, the Americans to win the Revolutionary War. It was the British, you know, marched down the roads and in the columns, the Americans. Uh, it would be foolish for them to do that. Uh, guerrilla warfare is better, you know, you know, using the tactics of rangers, the tactics of the Indians than it is uh, going up against a, a trained battle hardened army. Um, the American Civil War brought with it a variety of men who were versed in ranger tactics. The most famous was John Mosby. Uh, he became known as the Great Ghost. Mosby originally joined as a private in the Confederate Army, soon found himself scouting and running raids under the leadership of uh, the audacious cavalry commander Jeb Stewart, uh, who was seeking to disrupt communication, the flow of supplies to Union troops at the front. These partisan rangers operated very differently from the regular Confederate Army at the time, as they kind of, they lived scattered among civilian population rather than big army camps. That way, they could, for stealth reasons. Uh, early successes included a raid that captured the Union general uh, Edwin Stoughton. Flash forward to World War II, uh, the capabilities of Ranger battalions come into full focus. In the, Euro in the European theater, they became known as Darby's Rangers, while in the Pacific, they were called Merrill's Marauders. Uh, the name Ranger was selected due to the long history of Ranger activity in the United States, and also, well, the name Commander was belonged to the British, so they couldn't call him that. They chose uh, Captain William Darby to lead the effort to, due to his outstanding reputation at the time. And Darby carefully cultivated men from other units in Britain and subjected them to very strenuous weeding out process. Colonel Darby eventually had 10,000 men under his command, led them through the bitter, uh, the bitter winter mountain fighting in the Italian campaign. Uh, and these kinds of operations were typical of those given to Ranger units. On another front, the 2nd Ranger Battalion was given the task of leading the assault on Om Omaha Beach in Normandy on D-Day, June 6, 1944. Uh, under the command of Lieutenant James Rudder, they assaulted the perpendicular cliff on Point du Hoc as German machine guns battered their ascent for two days and nights. Uh, their successful mission destroyed the gun battery that could really take in pot shots at the invading military fleets that were, they were, they were out, uh, out on, off the coast. So Ranger units have really distinguished themselves ever since. Let's move to Special Forces units. Um, July 1952, the U.S. Uh, Army Special Forces officially formed under the command of Colonel Aaron Bank. Uh, officially formed, however, the seeds were planted uh, for this foremost champion of unconventional warfare much, much earlier. The first Special Service Force was formed in July 40, 1942 as a joint American and Canadian unit. They received the nickname the Devil's Brigade due to their first fighting against the Germans. Uh, the unit adopted the crossed arrows as their signature, which is still a brand's insignia for uh, Special Forces today. Special Forces counts the long ranger lineage of the U.S. Army as well as Merrill's, Merrill's Marauders due to their history of being elite units that operated behind enemy lines. Uh, Special Forces lineage can also be found in the guerrilla operations conducted behind, Jimmy, behind Japanese lines in the Philippines. Uh, Major Russell Volkman and Lieutenant Don Donald Blackburn refused to surrender at Bataan and formed a Filipino guerrilla band in Luzon that eventually grew into four regiments. Colonel Wendell Fertig raised another Filipino guerrilla force that grew to around 20,000 men. Uh, and this classic insurgency against the Japanese lasted until the end of the war. <clears throat> One question I get a lot is the difference between Rangers and Special Forces. Uh, while sharing a lot of same, the same capabilities, Ranger missions tend to be more short term <clears throat> kind of shallow penetration affairs, while Special Forces missions are much longer in duration, much com more complex, and usually have much uh, stronger strategic implications. Um, the, the tactics that they use when you're behind enemy lines is a is guerrilla warfare. This is the raids and ambushes uh, that we talked about earlier, uh, as learned by the, the Rangers and the Indians. <clears throat> but you use these raids, uh, raids and ambushes against a much stronger force that way enable you to strike at will and then get away uh, without having the larger force crush you. And by the way, the term guerrilla 
uh, it comes from derived is derived from the term guerra, which is the Spanish for war. <clears throat> the strongest seeds of special forces were found planted during World War II in the uh, Office of Strategic Services, founded and directed by Medal of Honor recipient Major General William Donovan, uh, he, and everybody called him Wild Bill. <clears throat> Following, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Following World War I, the United States had dismantled most of their coordinated foreign intelligence gathering capabilities, believing, well, that there was no need and that gentlemen do not read each other's mail. Uh, Donovan, <clears throat> when he was appointed by the president, envisioned the OSS to go far beyond just collection, research, and analysis of intelligence. He also guided the organization to counterintelligence and paramilitary activities. So the OSS engaged in espionage and sabotage operations in Europe, the Middle East, North Africa, and East Asia to include guidance, equipping, and training of behind-the-lines guerrilla armies. It's notable uh, that the four future directors of the CIA actually served under Donovan, Alan Dulles, Richard Helms, William Colby, and William Casey. Uh, Donovan, Donovan did set up espionage and sabotage schools, recruited agents for this, this new OSS venture, and it, he said his, he was primarily looking for a PhD that could handle himself in a bar fight. So he needed brains and brawn. Uh, the OSS had two missions in Europe. The first consisted of infiltrating three-man Jedburg teams in the German-occupied areas such as France, Belgium, and Holland. There they would work with the local resistance to conduct guerrilla operations and grow the movement. Uh, these Jedburg teams were all linguists, uh, well-trained, typically from different nationalities. Their primary method of infiltration was by parachute. Uh, supplementing this effort was uh, another part of the ASS, which were the operational groups. And these were a little bit larger in their makeup and they were tasked with more direct action missions such as sabotage and conducting raids behind enemy lines. Probably the most successful OSS operation in Asia, Asia was conducted on, by Detachment 101. Uh, they deployed to Burma. They recruited 11,000 Kachin tribesmen to trade them into a force that eventually killed 10,000 Japanese with minimal losses. Uh, the OSS also played a crucial role in mobilizing all the fresh French resistance elements and providing intelligence for the Normandy beach landings. Uh, John F. Kennedy, when he became president in uh, January 1961, uh, by then special forces had grown into three groups, the first, the seventh, and the tenth. And all three groups were actively pursuing missions all around the world. Now, President Kennedy was a keen student of military affairs, and he developed a real strong interest in insurgency and counterinsurgency operations and the grill operations that complemented those forms of warfare. With support from the young president, special forces found a more permanent foothold in U.S. military doctrine. Uh, when, the, when the president inspected Colonel Bank and his troops, they all put on a green beret to greet him, much to the chagrin of the conventional uh, military leadership. And on the spot, the president authorized the, the wearer of the Special Forces Green Beret and further identified it as a symbol of courage and distinction. Uh, the exploits of the Special Forces were such that during the early days of the Vietnam conflict, uh, Barry Sadler came out with something called the Ballot of the Green Beret, which ended up being the number one hit in the country in 1966. And uh, his line from that song, that 100 men will test today and only three win the Green Beret, that's not far off. It's a pretty exclusive group. Uh, so Bill Donovan's transformational leadership in World War II to the will of Aaron Bank to make it all happen, this all resulted in special forces teams that are currently deployed all over the world. Mo most quite frankly, you don't hear about. Uh, they'd like to be called quiet professionals. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Talk about literature. Um, uh, and another way of standing on the shoulders of giants. Well, as you can see from these pictures, I've used my very serious hobby to abuse my family by dragging them all over the world, usually dressed in Victorian costume. Uh, Christopher Morley, the gentleman with the pipe, uh, he liked to start stuff. Um, born in 1890 in Pennsylvania, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Haverford College named the Rhodes Scholar from Maryland, read modern history at Oxford for three years, and his expertise was literature. Uh, after assuming some editorial positions in Philadelphia, he moved to New York to work for the Post, and he founded the uh, Saturday Review of Literature. On the side, 
he was a very social guy. He founded the Three Hours for Lunch Club, where he met his friends for lunch or drinks. Uh, these were often referred to as the whiskey and sodaites. Uh, from this sprang something called the Baker Street Irregulars in 1934, as literature discussions focused on Sherlock Holmes of this uh, Three Hours for Lunch Club. Uh, membership is invitation only, and it initially consisted of just being a friend to uh, Christopher Morley or completing a very difficult Sherlock Holmes crossword puzzle that was published by his brother. Uh, but here we have a classic example of transformational and transactional leadership. Uh, as the organizational grew in stature, the seriousness uh, and the seriousness as a, as a major publisher, Morley became increasingly disinterested. He liked the social side. He didn't necessarily like the business side. Into the breach steps somebody named Edgar Smith, who is a division manager with General Motors, known for his efficiency. He immediately created a more formal organization and organized an annual dinner, amongst other activities. Uh, despite only having 700 invested members since its inception, the Baker Street Irregulars is one of the most influential literary organizations in the world. Uh, past members include people like Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, scientist uh, Isaac Asimov. I remember at one meeting chatting with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar about the, his recent book uh, that was published on Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock's brother. So uh, here we see where transformational with transactional leadership combined can create something that leaves uh, a lasting impression on the world. Speaking of leading a lasting impression on the world, Stephen Jobs. This is our modern day example. So uh, what's interesting about Stephen Jobs is, that, you know, he was a, a transformational leader within Apple. Uh, he managed to bring together three elements that already existed in the marketplace and bring them together a unique way to produce the initial product that resulted in a, in a string of hits. And I'm, I'm talking about the iPod. He also did it with the Macintosh. That's another story. But you have to ask yourself with the, the iPod. At the time, did digital music exist? Well, ask any college student at the time who had an Napster account. The answer is yes. Uh, did digital music players exist at the time? The answer is yes. Uh, Rio was one of the leading brands, but they, all, they were kind of clunky looking. And could you get digital music onto a digital music player? And the answer is yes, but you had to know how to do file transfer protocols, which is kind of a, a, a technological thing you had to learn. So what Jobs did that was innovative was to combine these three elements into unique, in a unique way such as to produce a truly breakthrough product. He combined a very attractive case for the iPod that provided what we call social currency for those who were seen with it. You look cool carrying it around. And he also provided an easy way to load songs onto the iPod with the iTunes app. Even grandma could do it. And he did deals with record companies to offer quality songs for the download. Uh, usually on the peer-to-peer -peer system of Napster, sometimes you had to download a song as many as 10 times to be able to uh, get it operational because the, the quality is cut off halfway or whatever. So he, uh, you know, people were willing to pay to get a high quality song first time. Uh, and the rest was a matter of repatching, repackaging the iPod into a variety of more convenient uh, devices that remained aesthetically appealing and innovative moving forward. Uh, first the iPod, then the color iPod, then video iPods, eventually combined it with a phone called the iPhone, the iPad, Apple TV, iWatch, well, you're starting to get the idea. So, of course, now one of the largest companies in the world. Uh, what is interesting is we can find very similar patterns with the innovations of Bill Gates, with the Google guys, with Elon Musk, and many others. Uh, this is some of the things that I teach at SMU in my, uh, my innovation course. Uh, but all of these guys blended existing ideas in a unique way to be able to transform entire industries. As sort of a recap, I'm going back to our original uh, individual, Carl Van Clauswitz. So once again, we're looking at constantly learning and st strategic intuition draws upon the experience of everybody else in the world. So if you're constantly learning, you're constantly looking for opportunities, you're constantly looking for ways to apply technology and different ideas with which you may come in contact, that's the, that's the foundation uh, for, um, you know, innovation. Uh, Clausewitz, of course, you know, he noticed that there's all these unexpected developments unfolded under the fog of war. A truly innovative person 
excels uh, during this area of confusion. And so usually you see innovators really excel during periods of high uncertainty. Um, you know, we talked about the, you know, the presence of mind, the difference of the different levels of intuition, regular, Leroy Jethro Gibbs and his gut on NCIS, the expertise of an EMT operator as he comes and uh, comes across somebody that, that needs some medical help. But then we've got strategic intuition here and the, and the coup de wee. So bringing all your examples from history, constantly learning and increasing the database of your brain, having the presence of mind to get that good idea, either while exercising, meditating, taking a shower, falling asleep in traffic, whatever it is, whatever works for you, you're relaxing and being able to allow your un unencumbered uh, un and unprejudiced uh, self to come up with, you know, a really true flash of insight. And then, of course, having the will to follow through. Once again, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me here to speak to you today. It's been a real honor, and uh, I'll look forward to uh, answering any questions that you may have. Mm -hmm.